Okay, the first question I have for everyone is why aren't my slides on the screen? Um, so I'm going to first of all thank the organizers um, for inviting me. And uh, secondly, I'd like to point out that, um, as we all know, there's a great variety of electrical personalities in neurons. And Bruce Bean's talk yesterday showed us beautifully that those different types of firing patterns can be associated with different patterns of expression of potassium channels. But I want to make the point that potassium channel expression does way more than simply regulate the excitability of cells. We think a key thing about potassium channels is they each talk to different cytoplasmic signaling proteins. And I'm going to try and illustrate this with the KV3.3 potassium channel, which is expressed in a variety of very fast-firing neurons. It's particularly high levels in Serapakinji neurons. It's also found in many brainstem nuclei. And what you see how the, here is the expression of KV3.3 in the calyx of held, which is a very large presynaptic terminal that is required for localization of sounds in space. And KV3.3 is, here is found presynaptically. KV3.1 is the predominant postsynaptic neuron um, channel. But they have very, very similar electrical properties. What KV3.3 has is its own disease. And mutations in KV3.3 produce spinous cerebellar ataxia type 13, which is primarily associated with dege degeneration of the cerebellum and loss of Purkinje cells, where KV3.3 is expressed. It's also associated with the inability to localize sounds. And this is quite a striking effect. Um, the disease, the late onset disease with KV3.3 mutations, uh, typically occurs mid age. But Patients with these mutations, even when they're teenagers, can't localize sounds in space. So most people can localize within 10 to 80 microseconds difference of time arrival between the two ears, and that's how you figure out whether someone's on your right or your left. Um, but people with these mutations, they can't tell almost a millisecond time difference. They can hear perfectly normally, but in a cocktail party or something like that, they'd have a lot of problems. So we were persuaded very forcefully to work on one particular human mutation, G592R, in this potassium channel. And when we express this mutation, we get perfectly normal potassium channels. Uh, this is the wild-type human KV3.3. This is the mutant expressed in CHO cells. We've expressed it in HEK cells as well. The only difference is that there's a slightly slower inactivation over 600 milliseconds or so, it inactivates more slowly. No difference in voltage dependence, slower inactivation. But the job of these potassium channels is to repolarization, repolarize action potentials that are less than a millisecond, a few hundred microseconds. So at first sight, it's difficult to know if this has any physiological significance. So we looked at where this mutation is found, and it's in the C terminus. And if you look at where it's embedded within the C terminus, um, it's in a string of polyprolines that is present in this larger KV3.3 cytoplasmic C-terminal domain, not present in any of the other KV3 channels. And if you blast this sequence, you find that it's very closely related to sequences that are found in wave and WASP proteins, which are proteins that nucleate actin filaments, add new actin filaments to pre-existing actin filaments, uh, using the ARP23 actin nucleating complex. And indeed, if we immunoprecipitate KV3.3 um, and then test for the presence of ARP23, we find that ARP23 is present there in the wild type channel. But with this particular mutant, there's no ARP23 associated with the channel. We then went on to show that this effect is not um, direct. What directly links the channel to the ARP23 complex is this protein called HAX1. And I'd never heard of HAX1 until we did this, but it turns out that it's an essential survival factor for um, Purkinje neurons and a variety of other neurons. So it was always considered as a cell survival protein. If, if you knock it out, the cerebellum degenerates within two weeks. So. Um, both the uh, wild type and the knock, uh, both the wild type and the knock, uh, the um, mutant actually both bind HAX1, 
but when HEX1 is bound to the mutant, it turns out it binds more tightly and fails to interact with R23. And I'll show you some evidence for that later. So what does KV3.3 do to um, the actin cytoskeleton? Well, if you take CHO cells, which are, for an electrophysiologist, really boring cells, um, they have actin stress fibers on the bottom. The ARP23 actin nucleating complex is found uh, distributed throughout the cytoplasm in a punctate pattern. You put in KV3.3. Now, all the actin and the ARP23 move under the plasma membrane where they co-localize with the KV3.3 channel. And now if you look at the cells expressing the mutant, which have perfectly normal KV3.3 currents, except for that inactivation, you find that there's no change in structure of the cell. It hasn't rounded up, it's still flat. And the ARP23 and the actin patterns look rather similar. And specifically, there's no co-localization of actin or ARP23 with the channels that are there under the plasma membrane. This is entirely me mediated by this HAX1 protein. Um, on the top you see here the localization of actin, ARP23, at the plasma membrane in a CHO cell that has KV3.3. Um, if we then do RNAi against HAX, then the cells flatten down, um, you, the stress fibers come back again, the ARP23 moves um, into a punctate pattern, and this is a sideways view of the Pattern, you can see the cells are flattened down, and in the green, the ARP23 has moved back into the cytoplasm. This is also associated with a very um, profound change in th the currents. So in the absence of HAX1 and the ability to act activate these actin nucleation, these channels now, instead of inactivating over 600 milliseconds, they now inactivate within um, 10, 15 milliseconds. This is what KV3.4 normally does. We've basically turned KV3.3 into KV3.4. Very rapid inactivation. We know this is N-type inactivation primarily. If we cut off the N-terminus, preventing the ball swinging in, then we don't get this very rapid type inactivation. Okay, so what's the point of having a channel that nucleates actin filaments? Um, and more importantly, where would we find a very dense actin filament such as we see with the CHO cells that are transfected with KB3.3? Well, the answer is the our favorite cells that we've been studying before. These are these calyx of held presynaptic terminals. Work by a number of groups had shown that this large calyx is what you see here has a very dense actin cytoskeleton under the plasma membrane. So what we've made a knockout of, we didn't make the knockout, we got the knockout and we made a knock-in of the um, G59R mutation that fails to bind actin. And then if we look at phylloid and staining of these presynaptic terminals in the wild type and compare it with the knockout and the KV3.3 um, knock-in, we find that this presynaptic actin cytoskeleton is very profoundly disrupted. If we do EM of these three types of animals in the calyx, we find that in the wild type, KB3.3 um, is found on the plasma membrane of the terminal, on the face facing the postsynaptic cell. This same thing is true for the mutant, um, the knock-in, where it's present on the presynaptic side facing the postsynaptic cell, adjacent to the uh, sites of neurotransmitter release. With the mutant, we see some of these dark inclusions, which I'll talk about later. Um, no signaling in the knockout. Interestingly enough, KV3.1 is present in these terminals, but it's re been reported to be on the other side, the back side of the terminal, not the side facing the postsynaptic cell. So what does... The, what is the consequence of this for neurotransmitter release and for the function of the calyx? So this is now looking at two things, the calcium current in the calyx of the wild type compared to the knock-in, to the knockout or the knock-in is identical. And what you see on the second line are capacitance measurements which measure mm -hmm. the uh, extent of the plasma mem membrane in response to here a single depolarization. Single depolarization causes excitosis followed by recovery of the size of the membrane which is endocytosis. You get with a single depolarization the same amount of endocytosis but greatly slowed exocytosis. And we were beginning to suspect this might be the case even before the experiment was done. 
because actin is known to be absolutely required for endocytosis of synaptic vesicles in the synapse. Um, you can also do a more rapid train of 20 depolarizations, which triggers a component of very fast endocytosis. That component of fast endocytosis is also disrupted uh, by the uh, knock-in or the knock-out, um, very much slowed. Um, and, but in this case, you also see a decrease in the amount of transmitter you can evoke with the repetitive stimulus. So the readily releasable pool is diminished, and we think that's because you need to endocytose and replenish the readily releasable pool during a prolonged train of depolarizations. So this is not specific to um, the auditory system. This is the same experiment done now in hippocampal cultures, which also express KV3.3, and this is using a different technique to look at exocytosis and endocytosis. This is using the fluorescent synaptophysin, synaptofluorin technique. And as in, in the auditory brainstem, you get, uh, with repetitive, a train of 20 action potentials, you get less release, um, but a very greatly slowed rate of endocytosis. So basically, that's uh, what we think is going on. We think that you need to have KV3.3 to organize the actin cytoskeleton. And in fact, this is work by Ling Gang Wu, with whom we've collaborated on all these experiments, showing that if you just do a conditional knockout of either beta or, or uh, gamma actin, you get exactly the same phenotype as if you knock out KV3.3 or have this non-interacting non uh, mutant. Okay, so... That, that's all fun. That tells you that this is actually a really important component of um, uh, the normal function, but it doesn't explain why the cells are dying. And so to try and address this, we um, did phosphoproteomic screening of the cerebellum um, and compared it to wild-type mice in the knock-in mouse compared to the wild-type mouse. And what, when we did that, we found that there was a three- to four-fold increase in the cerebellum, but not the forebrain, of out of 260 different kinases that were assayed, TBK1, tank binding kinase, was greatly elevated by the mutation. Uh, Essex kinase, a variety of other kinases were not uh, altered. TBK1 levels of protein were not changed. It was the phosphorylation state, i.e. the activation of TBK1 that was altered. Um, TBK1 exists in a complex with KV3.3. You can co-immunoprecipitate KV3.3 with TBK1. And this requires that C-terminal domain. If we start chopping off parts of the C-terminal domain, we get perfectly good co-immunoprecipitation until we've chopped off that little bit where that G592R mutation is, and then we lose um, the majority of interaction with TBK1. So what does TBK1 have to do with what I told you before? Well, TBK1 activity is required to keep that hax ARP23 complex together. If we apply a TBK1 inhibitor, we can no longer co-immunoprecipitate hax one with the channel, um, either the mutant or the um, wild type. And if we apply a TBK1 inhibitor, it has exactly the same effect on the inactivation of the channel as removal of HAX1. We get a very rapid inactivation of the channel after inhibition of TBK1. But TBK1 has a variety of different functions. And in fact, it's also involved in slower forms of endocytosis, I'm going to call it endocytosis, at least loosely associated with endocytosis, um, which is the removal of proteins from the plasma membrane or other parts, and then uh, wrapping them in a set of vesicles in another set of vesicles. And this is associated with autophagy, and it's also associated with my mitophagy. It's required for the phosphorylation of those adapter proteins that give you um, the, the um, the encircling of one membrane by another. It has a variety of other functions related to cell survival. But um, we decided to look at this in the mutant cells. Um, we first looked to see whether the activity of KV3 channels had any effect on TBK1 activity. And so what we've seen here is we're looking at phospho-TBK1, a 10-minute exposure um, to potassium depolarization. So if you take CHO cells that are either untransfected or express KV3.1 or BK channels, you get a very small increase in TBK1 activity. 
If, however, you depolarize cells expressing wild-type KB3.3, you get a very large increase in TBK1. With the mutant channel, now even before you depolarize, you get much greater TBK1 activity. And once you depolarize the, those mutant channels, you now get an even greater increase in TBK1 activity, consistent with what we found in the mouse brain that had this mutation. So, I told you HAX1 is a cell survival protein. It's required for the survival of the cerebellum. So what does the channel do to HAX1? Well, in the wild-type channel, by light microscopy, HAX1 localizes to the plasma membrane with the channel, just as I've described before. But in cells that express the mutation, we find a large proportion of cells that have this rather ugly staining at the light level, but in, when we look at this by electron microscopy, we see that HAX is now being bundled into these organelles that are surrounded by another organelle. These are multivesicular bodies. They're actually also kicked out of the cell. You can see little, if you have eagle eyes, you can see little depositions of, KVs, of HAX1 outside these transfected cells. And they're being kicked out of the cell. In many of these cells, the, um, these multivesicular bodies accumulate so as to totally pack the cells, and that these cells have a much higher rate of cell death than do the cells expressed in the wild-type channel. Um, not just morphologically, but there's a good molecular marker, CD63, which is a specific molecular marker. It's a tetraspanin that defines multivesicular bodies. That is way up um, in the cells that express the mutation. Um, and interestingly enough, if we inhibit TBK1, we can... Um, greatly reduce the formation of this marker for multivesicular bodies. So this is in the transfected cells. We've done exactly the same thing in the cerebellum of the mutant animals. We see these structures. We see a marked increase in TBK1 activity. We see a marked increase in multivesicular body markers. Um, and so our hypothesis is that this is uh, the, contributing to the, the cell death that we're seeing. So to summarize, we have KB3.3 channels which have a normal function of repolarizing the action potential. That's no, no question. That's what they normally do. But in addition to repolarizing the presynaptic action potentials, they are absolutely required for terminating the synaptic transmission by allowing the endocytosis of the neurotransmitted transmitter containing vesicles, whether by, by recruiting actin that pulls proteins sideways or by recruiting actin that is needed for the force to endocytose the uh, vesicular membrane. But in the absence of this, there's the, they have another capability, which is to activate TBK1. And when they can't do this normal endocytic process, this becomes greatly exaggerated, as in the case of the mutation. And now we get the envelopment of these uh, channels, and particularly their uh, cell survival protein, HAX1, uh, into these multivesicular bodies. And this is what we're proposing is the reason that these ultimately lead, lead to cell death. Um, I have to credit a number of people, Ling Gang Wu, uh, we collaborated with on the capacitance measurements, but the person who did the vast majority of this was Yalan Zhang, who's a research scientist in my lab. Thank you. Thank you, Len. Uh, it's open for questions. Diane? Len, I was wondering, do you think that the voltage sensor is important in the recruitment of acting, so somewhat akin to... Um, I think it's important. I, I don't think you need the... I don't know. I would hope so. I mean, I don't see why else you would want an ion channel to be doing this. What we, d we don't think ion flux is important for some of this because we can block the channel and we'll still increase TBK1 and do those things. But I'm, I bet that the activity of the channel, um, either the gating or the ion flux at the terminal, somehow modulates transmission over time. And we just haven't figured out can how... Can the, the sensor? I mean, can you stop in, in the same way that the classic work of the... Calcium, voltage gated calcium channel skeletal muscle. Like if we introduce a mutation that somehow would do that, yeah. Um, we'd love to do that, yes. Um, that, that would be a really important thing to do, yep. I think, it, I think you answered already. So the TBK1 hex complex, does it change the stability of the channel, the surface membrane, or, or, or not? Oh, yes. So um, 
It definitely does. So the fact that the wild type channel is embedded in this actin um, cytoskeleton means that it's pretty stable. So when we depolarize right. for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or, or even five hours, if we depolarize the cells for five hours, um, we still have the same amount of wild type channel in there. If we depolarize the mutant, which is not embedded in that side of skeleton, over five hours, the levels of the channel drop by 50%. 50, uh, 50 okay. So, yeah, definitely. So just a, a stretch of what you might have said already. So the, the, you mentioned about uh, stress fibers, and, and that reminds me motility a lot. Do you yep. know if there's anything to do with uh, axonal growth or directional changes or just motility of neurons? Um, I bet it does. Um, KV3 channels are often found in the very distal tips of neurites as they're growing, where I would guess that their role has something to do with motility. When we put this in a cell line that is very motile, if we put the wild type channel in, it tends to stop, it builds that act inside the skeleton, put the mutant channel in, and it just pretends that nothing has happened. So it certainly influences uh, mobility, and we don't know under what circumstances in the real nervous system it does that, but I I would think it would. And I, just, just another comment on that. Um, the, the patient who has this mutation, um, he, he's able to do this sort of thing say, um, perfectly well, um, which is when a normal person does this, you get the ipsilateral cerebellum lighting up. He has no signal in his cerebellum at all when he does that, but a much larger signal in the cortex. So something got rewired in that patient. Yeah. Bruce, do you have a question? It's Fascinating that you see it in the hippocampal synapses as, as, as well. Do you have a feeling for how widespread it is uh, in other kinds of synapses? So KV3.3 is um, more predominant in the brainstem cerebellum, but in, in the cortex it's primarily in interneurons, but it's present in mossy fibers and a few other cells. But certainly, you know, the fact that we saw this big change in the cerebellum with TBK1, but no significant change in the um, cortex, I think reflects simply that a far fewer neurons in the forebrain have KV3.3. But yeah, clearly it's present in... Um, is it possible that there, even though there isn't much protein, that it is in the synaptic endings? Yep, yep, absolutely. And I, there's uh, a bunch of papers now showing that at synaptic endings, in many synaptic endings, and perhaps most, if there's a KV3.3 channel, it is the dominant channel reflecting, regulating release. And it's for the reason that you described in your talk, it re activates more rapidly than anything else. So with an action potential, it's the first thing to turn on, uh, and it's the major determinant of release, yeah. Len, these multivesicular bodies are very different uh, from autophagosomes or uh, those end endosomal compartments. But so I, I'm still trying to learn about yeah. the cell biology of this. But if but you I activate KV3.3, do you see changes in autophagy? No. If you don't see, that, that, that's, that surprised us. We've looked at all the markers of autophagy, which we thought, and those are not changed, but the markers for multivesicular bodies are changed. And um, my understanding is the main difference is that... Um, Multivesicular bodies are formed from something that gets endocytosed and then it can re-endocytose itself, and whereas um, autophagy requires the addition of this extra membrane. So it's, it's slightly different genesis of the, those organelles. Yeah. Thanks. Any other uh, questions for Len? No, if there are no more questions, uh, please thank Len and the other speakers from this morning's session. Thanks, Len. And we are now going to break for uh, tea, coffee, and uh, posters, and we'll reconvene at 11.30.